You're listening to Artistic Finance, show 148. Thank you for listening. Today's show will be co-hosted by Dennis Size, that's me, and Cheryl Wisniewski, the VP of Operations at the Lighting Design Group. We're going to talk about how we put together a budget to light a TV show, including the information gathering, time, talent, equipment, logistics, all those elements that go into the line items for making a budget, and then many other hidden but oh so important costs. You're listening to Artistic Finance Podcast, where your host, Ethan Steimel, interviews successful artists, leaders, and investors to help educate and inspire artists to grow their wealth. Uh, this came out of a conversation that Ethan Steimel and I had when uh, we were chatting about the show, and he asked us if we would do an episode for him while he begins to become the father, or actually is the father now. But he uh, and Nicole, as you all know by now, have uh, given birth to a lovely baby boy, and uh, several people have stepped up and offered their time, our time, so that he could enjoy these very early stages, while he also packs his boxes to move out of New York and off to the world of academic theater and broadcast lighting. We're recording this on April 17th in the year of our Lord, 2023. And I'm saying this because that's what Ethan does. Normally, Ethan tells uh, uh, what's going on in the world today. Today's news headline is that after 35 years, Phantom of the Opera has closed this weekend. It launched in January of 1988. I was fortunate enough to be there in that cold winter opening night. The sad thing about this is that it has employed 125 people in the cast, the crew, and the orchestra every single night. And now those people need to seek employment elsewhere. The uh, show has been seen by something like, I don't know, 14 million people, I think. I can't remember the exact figures, and it's generated scads of money, I think $1.3 billion. It's really quite a thing. And I've seen the show several times, and I'm sure if uh, you follow what's going on in the world and revivals on Broadway, it will most assuredly come back in some reduced version. And you can see it traveling around the world. I'm Dennis Size. As I said, my official title is the Executive Vice President of Design at the Lighting Design Group. And I actually was a guest on Ethan's show way back in uh, August of 2020. I looked it up to see what episode, if anybody cares to look back, and you can uh, then see uh, all the fun things that we talked about. It was episode 17.5. I have no idea why I was a 0.5, but uh, I was the 17.5. And it's phenomenal that Ethan, after two and a half years, three years, is now up to episode 148. It's it's truly kudos to Ethan. And uh, one of the reasons that we're going to be doing this episode on budgeting is apropos of a recent show that he had in which all sorts of hidden costs were discussed apropos of insurance and uh, liability problems and behind the scenes costs. I actually said to him as a freelance designer and someone who occasionally freelances for the lighting design group, were you aware of all these hidden costs and what it takes to mount a production and where the money goes to? And, and Ethan said, no, but that would be a great thing to talk about. I talked with uh, our VP of operations, Cheryl Wisniewski at LDG, and she's agreed to co-host this with me because, well, number one, she's much smarter than me and <laughs> one of only two people in all of LDG who not only has her degree in theater design, but an MBA. And I mean, wow, that speaks volumes. Cheryl got her MBA a number of years ago from Loyola in Maryland. Let's just say, welcome, Cheryl. Let's talk. Let's talk. 
Cheryl, tell us a little bit about yourself. Oh, I have been with LDG since 2002 when Dennis brought me in as assistant lighting designer. As the company grew, I uh, started covering more and more production work on the side and stuck with that track instead of the design track. It took up so much time that uh, we had to hire more assistant lighting designers and grow. Over, gosh, the next feels like 400 years or so, I uh, racked up some exciting credits, like 10 Olympics, two royal weddings, five presidential election cycles. I had uh, a little bit of experience there to go a long way. And uh, on the side, I raised two little ones to the dreaded rank of teenager. And as Dennis mentioned, picked up my MBA so that I could uh, do even more on the finance side and managing of the company and the company's growth. My other time, my spare time, if there is any, is mostly with those two teenagers, one who is a soccer fiend and the other who is all about video games. The uh, One of the things I probably should have said is that the Lighting Design Group, if you're unfamiliar with us, is a uh, premier lighting design company, probably the largest in the country. We're coming up on 35 years, run by the president, uh, COO of the company, Stephen Brill, who started the company uh, almost 35 years ago as Burner and Brill Lighting. I have been with the company for just a little over 25 years when the name changed and became the Lighting Design Group. When I started with the company back then, there were four designers on staff, and now I lead a staff of designers numbering 27, I believe. It might be 28. Uh, The company itself has uh, almost 55 people on staff and continuing to grow. Pre-pandemic, we had over 60 people, and unfortunately, like most companies, we had to pare down, but uh, we're getting back up to the point we were at. Anyway, Cheryl, as Ethan himself would ask, what's a live event that you like to experience as an audience member? I'm going to harken back to my two teenagers here and say that what I really enjoy these days is taking them out to experience live events. Uh, many of them for the first time. Uh, you mentioned Phantom. We uh, made a trip around Christmas time up to the city so that they could see it on Broadway before it closed and knocked their socks off, which is great because Phantom was one of the shows that really inspired me to pursue technical theater. You, you can't beat a show like Phantom for introducing somebody who thought theater was fun to to Both backstage. your children? Both of them. Oh, wow. boy. Then. We had a great time. But I uh, I take them to shows in Baltimore on the regular and uh, and also to, to shows that their high schools put on because it's really great to get back to the, the roots of what really brought us all into the industry, our first shows, no budget, all creativity, balancing it with schoolwork and setting priorities and just that, that fresh look at something new from fresh eyes who haven't yet heard, no, you can't do that that way. That's not how it's done. And that adrenaline rush that they get seeing their friends up there and uh, even with with the lower production value, you you get that you still get that that joy of creating something new and fresh every time. So I really enjoy that, and it gives us gives us places to grow. It's interesting because uh, Ethan asks the question all the time, and it's funny the answers he get. As you would expect from most people in the theater, a live event, uh, the theatrical event, is what they like. Uh, a recent episode that he had uh, on liability insurance for circus performers, the favorite thing that the two people he was interviewing, uh, who was an insurance agent, Heather Zensen, and circus performer Lynn Lunny, their favorite things were going to the circus. And I thought, wow, that's that's fabulous. Uh, that's where the inspiration who, comes from. That's right. Uh, for those who care enough to go back to that 17.5 episode that I uh, uh, was a guest on, one of the things that I mentioned is one of my favorite uh, live experiences is going to museums. I don't know if that's borderline live event or not, but uh, Ethan being the crack interviewer that he is managed to take me to the point almost of tears discussing the first time uh, uh, I went to a museum and I was probably eight or nine. And the museum was the uh, Vatican Museum at the New York's World's Fairground in 1965, where I saw the Pieta and uh, really could care less. 
But then I relived that moment many decades later when I was doing a job at the Vatican and actually saw the Pieta again. That, that live museum experience is something that still jolts me. And, and even this weekend, I took uh, my own children to a uh, museum to see uh, the works there. And, and it's always a bit of a thrill. Not so much for kids, but it is for me. That being said, are you good or bad with money, Cheryl? Oh, it's both an appropriate answer. I spend all day long working with budgets and thinking about getting the best deal and squeezing it in, squeezing everything that we need into uh, into a number. I uh, by the time I clock out, I'm exhausted and have zero interest in thinking about money. Uh, my husband accuses me of being too gentle here with my disregard for finances. He he ends up carrying the brunt of it because I'm that done. You know, I pinch pennies at work. I plan ahead. But when it comes to my own needs, I uh, I'm hot and cold. I might wait until the car rusts out underneath me, or I might see a shiny object and buy 10 of them. I, I compensate for that by setting up auto payments and auto debits whenever I can so that my banking can manage my money for me. So maybe that's uh, maybe that means I'm good with money, but I know my weaknesses and, and get past them. Good for you, because uh, I am probably the world's worst person with money. Thank God I have a wife who's an accountant, because I have no idea how <laughs> money works. Uh, I've had money, I've lost money, I've had money, I lost money. I couldn't even tell you what I get paid. Uh, having somebody in your life who handles all that is the best possible thing you can have. And that leads me right into why designers need people like you, because most designers have the left brain, right brain problem, always have difficulty understanding why the numbers need to be as important as they are. It's kind of crazy. Uh, one of the uh, cover episodes that Ethan just did has been with the hosts of the very popular podcast, Light Talk. It's interesting because Steve, Stan, and David, the hosts of that show, are always so congenial and easygoing, and they're the best of friends. And, and this particular episode involved uh, good friend Ellen also, and they actually got into arguments about money. And I mean, fisticuffs, gauntlets thrown, daggers at dawn. <laughs> Uh, and it's a real problem with uh, creative people who just don't want to talk about money. Artists and uh, designers especially need to really understand the process, but shy away from it because as a designer, I know that the money that I have to work with is going to limit how creative I can be in terms of what kind of products I can rent, buy, beg, steal to uh, uh, allow my creative juices to flow. That being said, let's kick it off and, and just try and give us a rundown. When it comes to creating a budget, where do you start? And, and even though we work in television, I think, I think it applies to all live events, whether it's theater, television, or even our friends, the circus. Yeah, so we, um, step one is always information gathering, whether it's the client comes to us and says, hey, I've got a show. Or, uh, or we get a call from an architect or, or um, an integrator, or even just somebody walking up to a designer on site saying, hey, the next thing is, um, and, uh, and hopefully that LD can help facilitate that conversation so we can start off with, with um, knowing what those parameters are, at, at least as much as we can, um, whether it's just location, number of talent, number of cameras, a preliminary schedule, um, you know, what resources are available in the space and what the time frame is. Uh, once we have that, we have a baseline to, to start talking about those costs. Um, and we have to start thinking about all the various uh, phases that we have to address in our, in our budget because shows, big and small, all have the same phases. They, have, they all have the same steps, really, but in a, in a bigger scale or a smaller scale when it comes to time. So those are, that's a very big question. And I like to work directly with the, with the LD. That's um, very key because a lot of our LDs know without thinking what those parameters are, what, what things are that are going to affect the, the pricing. I think, Dennis, that's one of the reasons I like working with you because you will ask a lot of the questions that I would normally ask ahead of time. What do you look for? Because you know, the design should be driving the number. When we know that it's uh, you know, a big show, a small show, we have to, we have to drive it. The art leads. I mean, yes, we're, we can be adversarial and I have to say no, but really we want to start with that design. 
Uh, one, one of the things when you and I uh, discussed doing this earlier, uh, one of the things you brought up is trying to figure out what the budget actually is, what the number is that the clients try to hit. How, how difficult is that? information. It's one thing to understand the scope. The clients will always give you the scope, but how do you know what they want to spend? That's true. And a lot of times they don't know what they have to spend. In addition, you know, a lot of times we come in late, but in addition to that, they um, they may not know what they're asking for. They they want the show to look pretty. And how do you define what that is that, that goes right with it? So if they can't give us a number, we have to look at whether we've done similar projects in the past or if we've worked with them in the past and what they what we know their budget can can withstand or make a best guess that way we also will need to look just how how big the players are involved and and, and build from there um, that's where i think a uh, those preliminary discussions and then site surveys so we can see what we have to work with and then comes the discussions where we explain to them what it'll take to do what we think they're looking for it's interesting because too often, and it seems like it's becoming more and more prevalent, we're getting calls from clients to do shows and they have no budget. And right. and sometimes they actually have the gall to say, we have no money to spend. And, mm-hmm. and it's like a, a, a challenge. Are you going to do this or not? And it's funny, the, well, it's not funny actually, but <laughs> uh <laughs> What it becomes incumbent upon us then when we give the client a number so that they at least have a frame of reference, it becomes incumbent upon us to then uh, explain to them where that number came from, because 99.5% of the people we work for have no idea what it is we do. And then you have to explain. I was just dealing with a client on a project in Florida uh, is basically a brand new studio they wanted to do in a warehouse. And they had a, a couple of uh, areas in the warehouse. They were going to break up into, into different uh, playing areas, but they had nothing. And they needed us to figure out what it would cost to do. And I said right up front, before I get involved with this, this is a costly job. And even on the low end, on the low end, what you're talking about is about a million dollars. Then there's the deadly silence while they put the defibrillator on themselves and and start up their heart again and a million dollars is is really not that high for a brand new facility with everything being needed but i throw the number out there so that then i can gauge what the hell they really want to spend on that conversation i was able to say what we need to do then is talk about it and see what you're willing to give up and maybe we can get it down to like a half a million dollars at which time this particular prospective client said, hmm, that might be doable. Now I have a frame of right. reference. As fate would have it, once we worked up budgets, they didn't even have the half a million dollars. And they gave us that uh, famous line, we've chosen to go in a different direction. But but one of the things that's important, it's it doesn't even matter how big the job is or how small the job is, or if the job is a broadcast job, uh, an auto show, an event, a theatrical production, there's several dozen elements, phases, line items, if you will, that need to be considered when you're analyzing the budget. Let me, I wrote them down here so that we can talk about them. I'll go through these two dozen uh, line items. Most of them are so obvious, but at the same time, Uh, Most people forget them. Uh, Our production department here and the team that you lead does this all the time, whether the project is a small two-day job with 10 lights or it's one of your Olympic jobs, which is going to be planned uh, almost a year in advance with hundreds of lights. But every single job is going to involve, number one, those preliminary discussions that you mentioned and those meetings. It might just be a quick phone call. It might be uh, several phone calls. It might end up over a long haul being weekly meetings and weekly conference calls. There, the second item that needs to be put into a budget is a site survey. If a designer and a gaffer or the production manager needs to uh, uh, go downtown to Greenwich Village and look at a site that's going to be developed, that time has to be allocated. If the site survey happens to be in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, 
the airfare, the time, the day, the hotel, all of that needs to be allocated. A a site survey can be a very expensive line item. It could be relatively inexpensive. But once all those meetings and those surveys are taken care of, then the design phase can begin. And as part of that design phase, the fourth item in the list is production logistics. And that's really where you have to come into play with your team and hash out with the designer just how big they think it is, how small they think it is, what the site is like, what the client is like, what their appetites are like. A project for uh, a big network like NBC, ABC, or CBS might have a much higher budget than a home studio for somebody who's doing podcasting in Scranton, Pennsylvania. It, it varies, and, and what's, it's important. what's interesting here is that this is where we start the real starting budgeting portion of it. We have to collect all that information before we even begin a budget. And so you've spent time and energy and possibly expenses before we've even put a budget together. And that's one of those hidden costs you mentioned. So for the next few phases, we're actually budgeting as we're designing in a way. And, and the crazy thing is what I've just said, the, the, those four items, it could take an inordinate amount of time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and sometimes you get no money for that. Right. Uh, sometimes you have meetings. And as I said, regarding the job I just mentioned in Florida, they decided to go a different direction after we did all that. It's very difficult. It's like if you uh, have a problem with your car and you take it somewhere to get an inspection or, or an estimate, you're expecting the guy to do it with the hope that you can afford to do it yeah. and not be charged for the estimate. <laughs> And and but, most of the people we work with feel that, oh, well, we just talked about it. You just went to look at it. Do we have to pay for that? There, there's a cost to it. Obviously, if we get the job, then those costs can be can be entered into a budget. But once you have yourself that far and you really then get the client's approval for what you've given them as maybe an order of magnitude and said, oh, it's going to cost a million dollars. If they say, well, then let's keep going. Let's let's see what's involved. Then we can really go into the nitty gritty and uh, the designer and and your team in production and gaffers can analyze all the drawings, really get into it and see what the drawings for the studio are, what the scenic designer or the production designer's drawings are. So you can really wrap your brain around the nitty gritty of what the lighting scope needs to be based on the site and, and the project. After the drawings are analyzed, then you have to analyze the, the, the mechanical elements, the, the equipment that's at the site, not only lighting fixtures and inventory, but also the control equipment. Is there actually a lighting console that can be used to control the lights or do you have to acquire one? And as part of the uh, procurement of the equipment that's needed, you end up deciding if it's going to be a purchase or a rental or if the prospective client has stuff in his basement that he wants us to use. You know, I did a talk show a couple of years ago that's actually still running and we shan't use any names. But uh, when they called me, I said, what's the budget? And they and this is a big network show. And they said, well, we don't have any budget. We're going to use an existing studio and we'll use everything that's there. All we really want you for is the design. And I said, well, that's all well and good. But that particular studio was slated to be ripped down and all the lighting fixtures were thrown out because they were 70-year-old tungsten conventional fixtures that didn't work anymore. And it was like a big surprise. And ultimately, they didn't cough up any more money. What we ended up doing was getting lights from another studio that was being decommissioned by the network. And literally, they took the dumpster full of lights and dropped it off at the studio. And we hung and focused lights that were slated for demolition uh, out of a dumpster. So that, that, that particular phase, that analysis of equipment uh, is an important uh, line item because if you're doing a small job and you're, you're renting a half a dozen fixtures, it might end up being a thousand bucks. If you're doing a large job and you're renting 200 moving lights, the rental package could be 500,000 bucks. It's one of those things that needs to be thought about, planned out, and budgeted early on. Then once you have all that knowledge from your your discussions and your surveys and the scenic drawings and the studio drawings and equipment, then, then and only then can you begin the actual lighting design and plot out all the paperwork, at which time 
that's I assume the the area the 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 portion where you really hop in and and uh, try to rein back the creative uh, talents of the that's designers. That's when you start to fight. That's when yes. the fights start. In a loving way. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Always with love. In in the same way families fight on Thanksgiving. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, the, the next line item that needs to be budgeted after the, the plot and paperwork is done, it really gets into the nitty gritty. There's going to be some sort of a rental, some sort of purchase or, or existing fixtures are used. But whatever it is, there has to be some sort of equipment prep, usually in a shop. And, and if it's a rental house, that equipment has to be taken off the shelves and prepped and addressed. and uh, Or if it's brand new, it has to be unboxed. It's a possibility that cables, connectors uh, need to be put on it. But that initial shop prep can be anywhere from a couple of hours to a couple of weeks, depending on the scale of the production. And again, shop prep, if you're doing a small job, and many times I just have brand new gear sent right to the studio. And the prep takes place in the studio by the crew that's there. Maybe the first half of the day is prepping gear. It varies depending upon the scope of the job and how much money and aggravation and time you're trying to save. But it still needs to be included. All of these line items are design phases that that have to be put into a budget. Even getting once it's all done and equipment is prepped. Cheryl and her team have to include a line item for delivery to get all this damn stuff to the job site or to the location or to Beijing. I mean, it's one of those things that clients don't realize. And if you're sending seven tr- container trucks of lights to Beijing, it's not cheap. <laughs> We're quick. But I think what's what's really missed is that you know, one of the one of our inflation costs these days that and it's always been is is that delivery, those freight costs knock people's socks off on a regular basis. It doesn't feel like it should be that much just to load up a truck and deliver it, but it it's getting busier and busier and heavier and heavier to 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 bury that that load. Well, not that load. only that, I mean, as we've all seen from the pandemic, it's still carrying on pretty badly in our industry. The supply chain problems. You know, one of the nice things, uh, Lighting Design Group, we're such a large company and we do studios and facilities all around the world. We're also vendors for many, many manufacturers. So if a designer wants to get product X and all of a sudden it's going to take five months to get product X, we go to another product and and another manufacturer that that we uh, uh, have agreements with. It's, it's one of the nicer things in our company when we're purchasing and that we we can kind of vary the cost depending on the manufacturer, or the vendor that we use for the gear. Many times our designers want to get the, the newest, best toy oh, yeah. that's out there. But you know what? You can't always have steak from the high price steakhouse. Sometimes you got to get your hamburger at McDonald's. That's and my line. The, Oh, sorry. Cutting the budget. That's my line. <laughs> sorry. Uh, Cut that. Cut that. Be, being a guy that'll light a show with just about anything, including a mag light, I'm willing to certainly sacrifice uh, the high price spread, as it were, for less expensive gear. Again, it's a problem, especially with designers who feel they have to have that certain widget. And then that's when you and your team comes to fisticuffs with the designer. Or uh, similarly, it might not even be the gear. How often do you have to fight with a designer that that can't do the job with under 100 lights and you have to come back and say, that's all well and good, but we only have a budget for 25 lights. Common occurrence. It's a very common occurrence. Same thing goes with labor, too. If you're in a sure. 10 by 10 room hanging just a few lights, you're not going to have four ladder teams. There's not room for four ladders. It's another thing that I run into a lot. It's not just about the, the, the gear itself. It's about what does it take to put that gear in the air? You know, it, it's interesting, Cheryl, as I look at my little list of line items. We skipped labor. Yeah. We did. We absolutely did. I was thinking that. That's why I had to throw it in. I, I, I'm looking at it, and, and, and I forgot the line item for labor. As I said earlier, the, the phases of the production are always identical. You got the equipment prep or the purchase or the rental. Then Cheryl's got to deliver that stuff to the site. Then you have to load it in at the site, which is that load in day or two days or two weeks uh, is a cost. But 
the cost that comes with that load in is all of the crew people who are necessary. We're budgeting for a, a, a large show right now that we're hoping to get. And we're talking about 25 to 30 people, uh, electricians, stagehands, riggers for the load in. That doesn't come mm-hmm. cheap. One aspect of the production certainly weighs heavily on the other. If you're hanging 500 lights, you can't do it with three people. If you have to cut back on labor costs, that means you're cutting back on fixture costs. And even before the stuff loads in, you have to include in that cost whatever it is for rigging. Or or it might even be an installation of a grid. Uh, We have a very strong systems and facilities division that designs and installs grids and, and they have to do their thing before we even get to the light hang aspects so that we have a place to hang the damn lights. So once the rigging and the, and the grid installation is done, the next line item that needs to be budgeted for is probably some sort of pre-hang. I usually try and avoid pre-hangs because it involves a day or two of time that you can always afford. But if there's a ceiling on the set, or there's, there's audience bleachers and you can't get there to, to hang the lights because of the bleachers and you can't get ladders or genie lifts, then you need to pre-hang that gear, which brings a whole nother set of problems because if you can't get ladders and genies there once you've hung it, then how do you focus it? So it involves either moving lights or uh, climbers to climb the grid and focus. After all of that is done and you're starting to hang fixtures, a very important part before you can actually complete the light hang is knowing what on earth you're lighting. There's lots of discussions and there's lots of meetings and lots of site surveys. But until you're in that room with the director who's actually saying, here's where cameras are going to go, then he's determining where the talent is going to be that you're lighting. That's when you can actually determine where your lights hang, how they need to be focused. It's at that point you stand there in the room and you take that well-crafted light plot in your hands and rip it into a thousand pieces because it doesn't mean a thing anymore. I've done shows with 25, 30 cameras, more if it's a big event in an arena. You, You have no choice but to hang the lights where they need to be based on the blocking of the cameras and the talent. So you want to get that information as solidified and as concrete as you possibly can before you actually do the light hang. Front lights aren't that bad, especially if you're hanging moving fixtures. But if you turn somebody 30 or 40 degrees, all your backlights and side lights have to be taken down and rehung. And that's something that clients don't want to pay for. They expect you to know that up front and to have it included and do it right once. The the latest thing, by latest, I mean the last couple of years, now that we're in the world of LED fixtures, we're we're not hanging lights anymore. You know, you're not buying that $300 tungsten Lico. You're buying that $2,000 LED computer Lico. Instead of hanging lights, we hang computers. So there's a certain amount of power required. And everybody says, oh, I want to be green. I want to you know, be conscious of my carbon footprint until you tell them what it costs. Then all of a sudden their concerns about the environment aren't that great. But be that as it may, once the lights are hung, if they're all LED fixtures or moving lights and you're you're connecting them together, you have a power cable and a data cable going into it and you have one coming out. So now you've got four cables in all the fixtures and the networking has to be thought out extremely well with a an approach of common sense so that when the lights start moving, it's not that difficult to re-cable. So the important thing is get all the lights hung first, but then you have a line item now for cabling because you don't just hang a light and plug it into an existing connector or dimmer that's already there. Then once the fixtures are up, you focus it. And that's uh, yet another line item that needs to be put in, the day of focus or the two days or the two weeks of focus. Sometimes during that time, you can pre-program color temperature, intensities, uh, moving light positions, attributes, and maybe even get some cues in, into the console. But usually that's yet another line item that Cheryl has to budget for. And that needs to be done before you even get into rehearsal, because that's the next problem. You have rehearsal. The rehearsal doesn't necessarily need a full crew, 
but you'll have directors that want to rehearse a day or two days. I just launched an affiliate studio last week where they rehearsed for one month and it was just painful watching them make changes all the time. Then you have to go into the hostage negotiation to tell them why they can't use those positions or why they can't add the 30 extra camera angles that they want because the lights are hung and there's no money left. Uh, unless you have to go back to the bank and tell the client you need another forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars, which is always difficult. Sometimes that puts a, a much bigger onus on Cheryl and her team because at the, at the higher levels that somebody uh, of my skill sets and experience operates on, I can deal one on one with the clients. I mean, I know you deal with major clients if you're doing uh, Olympics or royal weddings. Do you prefer to do it yourself or let the designer do it? I think it depends on the on the client and it depends on the designer. In a perfect world, we're a team and we can tag team and cover each for each other and, and fill in the blanks for each other. And me saying no, you saying yes and, and letting them know you're talking into the best deal you can get. And that works well. But ultimately, it's, it's really a, about how we communicate it and, and show them what the possibilities are and what it can be. And that can be either of us and, and really depends on how we're talking and, and who, the, who, who they're most comfortable with. Uh, I should point out that when it comes to good cop, bad cop, nobody plays good cop better than Cheryl, uh, who's fabulous <laughs> with the clients uh, and, and who everybody loves, as opposed to me, who everybody hates. And uh, uh, I'm the bad cop all the time. I don't know. You've got you've got sales in your blood. You've got sales in your blood. I've just got the no nonsense. I'm going to tell you what it is and and I'll give you what I tell you. Two halves of the same good coin. I'll take the compliment. Um, anyway, moving on, one, once you have that uh, rehearsal process and your programming, as I said, it could go on for a couple of days. It could be a couple of weeks. Sometimes if you're doing a very small show, all of these line items that I mentioned could literally take place in one or two days, but they're all elements that need to happen in the sequence that I'm mentioning it. The rehearsal, once that's happening, it's inevitable that there are what I call improvements as the directors say, oh, gee, it'd be better if Cheryl was sitting on that side of the room and not on this side of the room. Can we can we like move the lights? And of course, you say whatever you want. And then they say, OK, everybody take a five while Dennis moves all the lights. And the crew looks at me like, a five? Is he kidding? The, there also needs to be a line item in there for what we call uh, rehearsal repairs, improvements, uh, tweaking, whatever you want to call it. And then after you do that, they do final rehearsals. And then there's more repairs because God forbid that uh, the producers and directors should make their mind up once. I, let's I also cut. add in, heaven forbid, a designer think that he got it right on the first try. Because I know someone in this room who will always find something to make it just a little bit better. We uh, just launched a show last week and my associate designer said, wow, we launched that show and we were only on revision seven of the light plot when we launched. The uh, gaffer on the show said, you had to do seven revisions before you launched? And the associate said, Oh, that's nothing. The last show we launched, there were 29 revisions before we launched it, which speaks volumes about how many uh, post light hang repairs and changes or improvements get done. Even after the show launches, one of the line items our production department has to put in is post launch improvements and tweaks, follow ups, whatever you want to call it. Because after the show launches, especially if it involves a, a major celebrity, they're going to get over the last three days. I've been emailing back and forth uh, with a very, fairly well-known anchor woman who uh, has been getting tweets and uh, messages on social media about her lighting and the way she looks. And so I've been dealing with all of that. It's one of those things that clients don't understand that. And depending on how high profile the celebrity is or the anchor is, they're going to demand that things be changed that make them more comfortable because some janitor in, in Poughkeepsie doesn't like the way the lighting is. Uh, as a matter of fact, one of the tweets that came into this anchor woman came right out and said, tell your lighting guy that he needs to change the color temperature on your lights. 
And I'm, uh-huh. So she, she calls me up and tells me this. And I'm like, my God, everybody and his brother has an opinion about things. Anyway, you, know, the, you always have to budget for those post launch improvements. And then the job is done. And is the job really done? Never for Cheryl and her team. Uh, actually, the designer has to fo- finalize all the light plots and the paperwork. Normally, we create what we call the production binder that we leave for the client and the head electrician or the studio LD, which includes miniatures of magic sheets and uh, inventories, uh, spec sheets on what they bought, channel hookups, dimmer schedules, uh, addressing information, quite a lot of information that gets left in the binder. So Cheryl needs to uh, make sure she budgets that line item because that takes time and the printing costs alone can run a, you know, a couple hundred dollars. Then the designer is done and Cheryl gets to do that all purpose famous thing, the closeout. Tell us a little about that project. <laughs> um. That is where we take all of our costs to date. Hopefully we've been tracking them all along if we're doing our jobs properly. Wrap them up into a tidy little package so that we can get the invoice out. But we're looking at any additions, any overtime, (coughs) any expenses and travel costs that may have been incurred, change orders that may have happened. We've added a position over here and that's gonna cost a little more. We try and keep those conversations with the client throughout the entire process so that they're aware of what's coming so that when we do send the invoice, nothing's a surprise. And that's when we uh, we get that out. We try and do that as quickly as we can after the after the launch happens. Though sometimes projects and those final improvements will will linger a bit. That's probably the the hardest step is wrapping it up into a into a neat little package with a bow on it. And the last piece, really, even after that, is the final follow up. We do want our clients to all be happy and to come back to us every time they have a project. So we want to make sure that we keep in touch and that we provide additional services as needed, whether it's quarterly maintenances or yearly maintenances. We uh, we stand behind the, the design work that we do on our installations. Good point. How often do you find that clients want us to continue coming back? Much more often than not. I think that the, our turnkey style of budgeting and support services is uh, is a really welcome thing in this industry where often designers will go from job to job, client to client, um, without the same back office support that we have. But because we have a big team, because we have a, a production department, we were able to provide that additional service and, uh, and make it really turnkey. And that's there's a premium there, but it's also, it, it keeps us in touch on many aspects of, of shows. And, and we can get into different parts of buildings, whether it's lighting the new atrium or the conference rooms or the, as you mentioned, the home studios. We're, we're very versatile in that. There's a couple other questions I have, but this is probably a good time to take a little uh, uh, intermission, shall we say? Yeah. Our friend uh, uh, Ethan, as you well know, because it's been said over and over, has a new baby and diapers are expensive. So in order to help Ethan buy his diapers, we need to mention the Artistic Finance Patreon page. If you're enjoying this show, or if you're not enjoying the show, it doesn't really matter, but we ask you to continue supporting Ethan. He has a lot of great shows and a lot of unbelievable information. I have an extremely busy schedule, but try to catch every weekly show or bi-weekly, when he, depending on when he releases them. The information that that he's managed to impart to not just designers, but actors, dancers, circus performers, uh, it's just unbelievable what he's done in, in 150 episodes. And he needs to continue doing that. So please support him. Consider uh, becoming a patron. Uh, I'm proud to admit that uh, I'm a patron and Lighting Design Group has also contributed uh, to his show in many ways. Uh, One of the nice things that when you're a patron is not only the satisfaction of knowing you're allowing him to continue on with this fine work, but you get early access to episodes on a private podcast feed. It includes early releases and bonuses. So for those who... uh, let's say, tuned into my episode, in addition to, if you were a Patreon, in addition to getting the episode, 
the patrons actually get all that private information in which I tell people about my secret passions and desires. So join join uh, the Patreon and uh, support Ian. Oh, one other thing. When I was talking to Ethan, he was telling me a lot of people don't like the theme music for his show, uh, which I believe is a cello. I'm not sure, but I believe it's a cello. It's what it sounds like. I happen to like it. If you like it, please tell Ethan before he spends money he doesn't need to, bringing in some flautist to uh, play some uh, uh, grunge music on the flute. Anyway, back to the show. You know, we touched on it briefly, Cheryl. Maybe you can expound a little bit more in dealing with the clients. Who actually should be speaking to the clients about numbers? You know, a a lot of uh, designers feel that they can't handle numbers or they don't know numbers. Some designers, I, I joke about the fact that I'm terrible with money, but at the same time, how often have I told a client when they ask for, for numbers, I don't really know numbers. I'm a designer. I have no idea what things cost, whatever I happen to tell them. Then I sit down with you and say, charge this much, charge this much, charge this much. And then you and I will, will haggle it out or I'll work with one of the other production managers. Who do you think and who does the team would prefer to speak to the client about numbers? It absolutely depends on who's in the room. The best camera you have is the one in your pocket. The best client communication comes with the person in the room with the client. I would prefer that the numbers come from me, whether they come from your mouth or my mouth, they should come from me. So that we've crunched the numbers, we know that it covers what we needed to cover. How it gets presented, I think depends on who the who the client will, will speak to the, the, the clearest and who they'll listen to. I mean, sometimes it's best to keep the LD out of that conversation so the LD can focus on the art and uh, not have to go down in the nitty gritty. Uh, you know, depending on how how much work is involved on on site, you also want to make sure that you know there's there's two sets of numbers. There's what something costs internally and what we're billing a client. They're they're not necessarily the same because of those, as we mentioned earlier, those hidden costs, those overhead costs that are in there. And you want to make sure that that you've accounted for that. So that's why I say the numbers should come from me, whether they're spoken with your voice or my voice. The, those numbers should come from me. It's interesting because designers, by and large, don't understand so much of those hidden costs that you talk about. And this is something that I had talked with Ethan about. It was apropos of the wonderful shows he did with uh, he did two or three shows about insurance, uh, liability insurance for performers. And he did a fabulous show with Philip Powers and Bill Rios on liability insurance for lighting designers and live event production. And they went into the weeds unbelievably well as to all of the issues and reasons that you have to have insurance. And you don't think about it. And when I had talked to Ethan about it, he never thought about it either. And I said, so when we charge somebody $4 million for a job, but we only pay you 32 cents, you don't realize that all of that money is to considerably pay for the hidden costs that go into it. I remember on a job site, one of our electricians drove a genie lift uh, by accident into a $12,000 touchscreen. And the next day, LDG got a bill for $12,000. I also remember another job we did at a very uh, high prestigious hotel in New York City. It was a long running show for a business network. And one of it was in a live venue that was a bar and restaurant and a patron tripped over one of our cables and it turned into like a $40,000 lawsuit. Could have been a lot more. Imagine if you're just a solo freelance lighting designer, Ethan Steinmill, and you get hit with a court case that's going to cost you $40,000. If you don't have insurance, you're sunk. You really are. Uh, you know, we do jobs that uh, the rental is three, four, five hundred thousand dollar rentals. Imagine if a truck gets into an accident taking back the gear and the missing and damaged is astronomical. And I think that's that's one of the differences between what we do at LDG and, and a lot of freelance designers out there. The freelance designer may have their their day rate that they quote to the studio or the producers and they come in and will give the the producer a list of gear, a list of labor required, and this and the producer's procurement folks will bring in the gear and bring in the labor, which which shifts that that cost to the to the production company in, in a way that we don't have that for us because we do it all. 
I mean, yes, some of our jobs are design only, but for the most part, we do provide labor, we do provide gear and, and do a more turnkey approach to things. But in that in that fee that that individual designer charges, they know that we'll just we'll call it a thousand dollars. But a portion of that is going to go to their own health insurance and to their transportation to get to site that day and to doing any drawings and to any extra meetings Taxes. That they have. Taxes. Yeah. So they have them maybe on a smaller level to, than ours. Ours may be bigger because of our 55 employees and our freelancers that we hire with our health insurance and office space and I.T. support. We have that a bigger scope, but those costs are still there. And, you know, and apropos of that, profitability is key, whether it's on the scale of the work we do or on individual designers uh, point, you need to know your value. You need to think about, you know, is that fee uh, enough to cover those costs? Does it cover your time, your energy, your transportation, your, your health insurance, your, your, your meal for the day? Is that all covered in your fee? Because if you start inching up so that those ancillary costs cut out of your fee, then, then you're not making enough to support yourself. You have to make sure that you're compensated well enough to uh, to support yourself in a way by being a full company and having those fees covered in our overhead. That's not something that we have to think about on an individual basis. I'm guessing based on uh, just knowing all the the job lists that you have, we probably have, what would you say, another hundred at least freelancers mm-hmm. who do gaffers, programmers, uh do, do they work for standard rates or do you have to essentially negotiate with them and then determine what their overhead costs are based on that? A little bit of both. It depends on, again, so many things depend on the client. We have some uh, contracts with clients and those are contract rates that we have to work within. Other times we may be going uh, and doing a job out of town and there are standard rates in different parts of the country or different parts of the world. That we have to uh, we have to 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 be aware of and we have to follow. If I'm doing a job in California, I know that the labor out there costs more. There are other taxes out there that we have to pay for that that we don't necessarily pay in New York. So so how do you deal with a client who, if they're used to paying five hundred dollars a day, just to throw a figure out there for a gaffer, and then all of a sudden you're going to California and you're charging seven hundred a day? How how do you deal with that? Because that's not what they're used to. It's not what they're used to. So my method is to be open and honest and let them know where those changes come and why those changes come from the get-go. I don't spring it on them later. I start that conversation very early and say that we're going into a part of the country. Sometimes we're in a part of the country where there there's no rental shops nearby and we're going to have to truck something in four hours or eight hours away. And that that increases those costs. And so those are conversations that we put on the table right away. We want to be very clear and, uh, and make sure that our expectations mesh. You know, that's the only way to keep everybody in the equation happy. Very often I hear in the field from freelancers, we love working for Lighting Design Group because we get paid immediately. And LDG has a reputation for getting our freelancers paid basically at the end of the week. Many of our clients don't pay at the end of the week. So how how do you cope with that floating of money, shall we say, where we might have to pay off our rentals and our bills and our freelancers, but a client might not pay for, and sometimes, correct me if I'm wrong, networks will pay two, three, four months after the job. It can happen. It can happen. But we are constantly in uh, different stages on different projects. As you know, Dennis, ever since the day you hired me, I've been saying, when are we having a slow time? You promised me a slow time. Um, because we, we're, you know, we've got, we've got some projects that are in pre-production. We've got some projects that are loading in today. We've got some projects that are loading out today. We have some projects that, that we are, um, that we consider prospects that we're pursuing. We've got some that we're closing out. And so because there's a constant flow of projects at different stages, we've got money coming in at, at various times. There are times of the year where it can get a little hairy, a little nervous, racking. Um, and there are times when, um, when, when we have to really plan ahead, but we, we do try and keep a steady flow. I mean, I don't want to go too nitty gritty into um, cash flow statements and, and gap accounting, but that's really where it is. We know when our slow periods are going to be and we try and plan accordingly and make sure that we have, have the funds ready to go. The overheads and costs being what they are, if, if you're a top-notch programmer and, and you feel that you should be paid $1,000 a day, but at the same time, the client won't pay a thousand a day. Do you ever wheel and deal or negotiate or guarantee somebody, oh, well, instead of using you for two days, we'll guarantee you for 20 days. 
uh, and maybe use them on other jobs. Is that also a, a I don't want to say tactic, uh, but uh, a way to guarantee that the high quality staffing and freelancers we use still get what they deserve when we can get it for them? Absolutely. And we do we do work to build that trust overall in general that sometimes sometimes the rate won't be exactly what you want. Sometimes we'll we'll do our best to uh, to honor it when we can or even do better if we can. But we, we will often, especially in the busy seasons, the election cycle being one of them, that we know we're going to have a certain amount of work that's above and beyond the usual. And if we can put someone on a, on a temporary contract as opposed to a, a one off. Absolutely. I think we do that for um, for some of the coverage that you do, Dennis, where we'll take the team, the, the core players to, to every debate if we can for the for the for certain clients. And that that I think helps. It keeps the team consistent. It makes the team stronger, builds bonds. And you become a family on the road in a way that you that you don't wouldn't necessarily if you were just hiring people one off. Well, you must be doing something right because you've done, I think you said ten Olympics so far from reading client rosters and crew rosters. You seem to always take the same people with you. That's oh, a good thing, right? It is. I think a job like the Olympics gets into your blood. And like I said, it becomes a family over the years. And the same folks have been have been working on the Olympics for as long as I've been and some even longer. I think Steve's done 13 now, 14. I'd have to, I'd have to count on my fingers, but it really is. It gets into your blood and it, and it gets, it never is routine, even though it feels like it should be. I mean, you've got, you've got studios, you've got venues, you've got commentators and commentaries, and they feels like it should be something that you can pull right out. But everyone is special. Everyone's different. And I think that keeps the excitement flowing. What's the longest amount of time you need to spend when you're at uh, uh, an Olympic uh, in South America or Sochi or somewhere? About two months, eight weeks or so. It's about about the time I spend on site, plus any site surveys and uh, post-production. And if we're prepping gear, often it's 220 volt, depending on when the where the, where the world it's taking place. So we may prep some gear here in the U.S. and some gear in the U.K., maybe some gear in Asia. And so there, there may be some some traveling to put that together. That's in addition to our regular shop preps. As you mentioned, it can be seven C containers worth of equipment, really tightly packed seven C containers worth of equipment. And so we we do end up working with folks all over the world to to put that together. I notice a lot of the people that you take that you travel with, and yourself included, have children. How how does that work? Oh my gosh, it goes back to the uh, loving to take my kids to live events. In a way, I've, I've always said it. I've traveled since before I had kids, so they've never known otherwise. But it also, I think, it builds stronger kids to be able to take them to some of these places and to show them what's out there and to dive into other cultures. I'd love having my kids able to to visit me in different countries and to to explore and to learn and to grow. It also makes for a great back to school essay when school starts back <laughs> up. And what did you do last summer? My son did one time get a note sent home saying he's telling everybody he went to Rio this summer. You might want to have a talk with him. But teacher, he did go to Rio this summer. He did practice learning Portuguese. I think it's good. We're, we're showing our kids, you know, I'm a 90s kid, so you can be anything you want to be. You can do anything you want to do. And uh, you just have to work hard and, you know, and be creative with it. So I think it's good for our kids. Good for you, mom. Next year, where do you go? Paris? Paris. You taking okay. the kids? Absolutely. Oh, wow. yeah. they can't wait. It's they They're probably going to be driving me bonkers for two months when I'm sleep deprived and they want to go see the Eiffel Tower again. <laughs> wow. Take a couple extra LDG wrenches with you. Put them to work. They're almost old enough. The, the clock on the wall tells me that I'm past my bedtime. I think it's time to wrap it up. One of the things that Ethan usually does uh, as the host is that uh, – he allows the, uh, the the guest to ask him a question, but we're kind of co-hosting this. Uh, but since I've been asking you dumb questions, is there anything you'd like to ask me that you've got me on the spot and you could ask me now? Yeah, it's not really budget related, but um, you often have a good feel for where the world's going and the, the entertainment world. And, and sometimes you've you've pointed out where things are shifting in the in the industry and in the world and where we're going. Whether it was the, the, the how LEDs started to make a an entrance into our world, to green initiatives or home based studios and things getting simpler, do you see anything on our horizon now that you're that you're keeping an eye on a trend of some sort? It's interesting. Years ago, uh, when I was teaching at Carnegie Mellon, I advised all the students. Uh, this is like 
25, 30 years ago to really brush up programming skills and computer skills, IT skills, networking skills, because I had the sense that at that time, when LEDs were coming into the forefront, that's the skills they would need to have. I can always tell by the nature of the skills that I don't have. And what makes somebody valued, valuable to me and to a lot of the old boomers that I work with are having people working with you that know what you don't know. And, and what I don't know can fill the encyclopedia. I guess there isn't an encyclopedia now for my friend Google. Um, at one time, somebody asked me that at school in, 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 uh, when I was teaching. And I pointed out in Star Wars, the original movie, if you remember, there was a chess scene where they were playing chess. The chess pieces were alive. They were holograms. Mm -hmm. And the chess pieces themselves kind of jumped around. And, and as I watched that in the movie, I thought, wow, this is entertainment. They're watching essentially a story unfold. And it doesn't matter if we're doing theater or dance or a broadcast show or a soap opera where I cut my teeth. It's all about watching the story unfold. Just because we sit in a living room and watch a black box or nowadays a thin piece of glass it doesn't mean that's the way it's always going to be. That chess game in Star Wars was the forerunner of where it's all going. And if you follow the trends right now, if you know uh, the group ABBA, who is out on the road on tour right now, they are not on stage. It's holograms of the original ABBA performers yeah. who were performing on stage much like that chess game in Star Wars from 35 or 40 years ago, whenever it was. I mean, I've been doing virtual reality for probably 25 years now. The early virtual sets that were being done, and from our point of view, you're essentially lighting a green screen, but in the virtual world, the sets have to be built in a computer. They would bring in the sets. They didn't quite look right. And producers would say to me, there's something wrong here. And I said, that's because you didn't have me come in and light the scenery. Whether or not it's being built in a shop or in a computer, somebody needs to light the set so it looks real. 25, 30 years ago, the computing power wasn't there to put in 500 moving lights into the virtual world. But it is there now. And that's really where it needs to go. We need to train people to light shows in the virtual world and then to take it to a whole nother level to the augmented reality. Are we lighting augmented reality in a conventional way? No, we're gonna be doing it with AI, with artificial intelligence. And if a client tells me, oh, we can't afford you, we're gonna go in a different direction. I'm telling you, I think that what they're doing is they're gonna, they're gonna have ChatGPT do my design instead of me. And that's really where it's going to go. It'll be uh, AI taking over the creative elements. And it's unfortunate, but I honestly don't think the job that I do, well, I do a very particular job, but uh, I don't think that the job I do will be around in 10 years. There will always have, be a need for a creative person to analyze how the story gets told, but it's going to be not in the conventional way we know now, but in a, a virtual way through IT and artificial intelligence. Anyway, that's just me speaking doom and gloom. I guess I'm supposed to ask you, how do people find you, Cheryl? Easiest place is probably the LDG website under the team link or LinkedIn. I'm also on Instagram at swiz321. I uh, love to chat with people. I love the idea of paying it forward. And I love the idea of talking with students and young people about what we do and, and how to get where we are. Absolutely reach out. I'd love to work with you. I'd love to chat with you. If anybody needs to contact me, you can just do size, S-I-Z-E, -E, at ldg.com. It is the one and only email address I actually have, so it's the only way to get me. Or you can call me on the phone. I have one phone number. You can reach me. Or call Cheryl, and she'll connect us. Anyway, thank you for your time. That's it for this week's episode. If you liked it, mention it to everybody and anybody to tune in to episode 148, where you can hear LDG's smartest person and one of two MBAs in the company expound upon creating budgets. 
And also, they've just started a monthly financial independence book club. Ethan and Amy Deluxe assign a financial independence independence book, and then they get together to discuss it. Meetups are totally free. Attendance prizes are given out. As a matter of fact, one month, the prizes were lighting design group hats and tote bags. What could be better than that? To find out the details of this month's book club, visit artisticfinance.com slash book club. That's it for today. Until next time, break a leg. Ethan, hit the cello. Thank you for listening to Artistic Finance. Make sure to subscribe. To access our show notes, transcripts, or resources, go to artisticfinance.com. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any decision, consult a professional. This show is copyrighted by Artistic Finance. Written permission must be granted before syndication or rebroadcasting.